Uh, welcome to the Adult Obesity Guideline webinar series hosted by the Office of Lifelong Learning and Obesity Canada. Uh, my name is Arya Sharma. I'm professor of medicine at the University of Alberta. I'm also the scientific director of Obesity Canada. Uh, and it's a great uh, pleasure uh, serving as the moderator for today's session. Uh, I also had the pleasure of serving on the executive of the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines. Uh, as you probably know by now, the new clinical practice guidelines are expansive. They cover 19 chapters on a wide range of topics related to obesity diagnosis and management, uh, weight bias, and much more, all written by Canada's top researchers, health practitioners, and patient advisors. Uh, they're the first truly patient-centered clinical practice guidelines on obesity and the result of more than two years of hard work. Just before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories across Canada of the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So today I'm pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Denise campbell Share, who will be presenting on primary care and primary health care, uh, and will be taking us through the case discussions today. Uh, Dr. campbell Share is professor in the Department of Family Medicine and a family physician with clinical and research interests in evidence-based clinical practice and implementation science. She completed her residency in family medicine at McMaster University, then worked as a rural family physician prior to spending five years on faculty at the University of Michigan. She joined the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta in 2009 and became Associate Dean of the Office of Lifelong Learning and Physician Learning Program in 2017. She also leads an interdisciplinary research team, the 5A's team program, which focuses on improving primary care for people living with obesity. Dr. campbell Shearer served on the Executive Committee for the New Clinical Practice Guidelines for Obesity Canada and was the lead author on the primary care and primary health care chapter. So over to you, Denise. Thanks, Arya. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, welcome to the folks attending today. So this one's going to be a little bit of a different style of webinar than the previous. So we're trying to do a case-based discussion. and. Uh, we're going to um, have discussion throughout rather than just at the end. Uh, so we're hoping to go for a little bit more of a, of a dialogue and discussion. Um, Aria is going to keep an eye and the colleagues on the chat box because when I'm on the share screen mode, I can't see when people have their hands up. So um, bear with us. We're gonna try it this way and, and see how it goes. Um, so Aria has already introduced, these are my disclosures. Uh, so some research support as listed here. Um, I have been on uh, one um, uh, panel for Pfizer around patient journey. So that was my other personal disclosure. So following this workshop, um, what we're hoping to do is bring it home today. So people have been attending a lot of the different webinars we've been running since August on the different components of the CPG. And what we wanna do is apply all that knowledge um, to think about some cases and focus uh, predominantly on primary care assessment uh, for obesity. And Aria is here as well, and certainly has a vast knowledge on the tertiary space. Um, so if people have questions uh, pertaining to that, I'm sure he'll be able to address those as well. But the, the two cases we're gonna dive in today are both um, more from the primary care lens. And we're really gonna focus on the assessment chapter that you have seen previously um, around thinking about how we uh, describe root causes, comorbidities, and think about people's personal context and how that relates to their obesity management. Um, we'll then touch on uh, all together collectively um, how we might approach different therapeutic options that we've heard about previously in the webinar series that we've had in the guidelines. So um, be it around um, physical, physical activity and um, medical nutrition therapy, medication, surgery, behavioral interventions, et cetera. And really the crux is to try to think about how we help people develop personalized plans. Um, and so uh, we're gonna have two cases. The first one's gonna be a little bit more just around assessment uh, and the second one more around management. Uh, so what we really wanna do is uh, in the beginning here is really recognize that obesity is a very heterogeneous chronic disease. And because the causes are so heterogeneous, it means that we really need to think about individualized weight management. And so questions that should drive us um, as we're going through thinking about our patients are, why does this patient have obesity? How severe is this person's obesity? And what is the best treatment plan um, for this person? So I like this graph, uh, graphic that Aria created five or so years ago. And, um, 
you know, when I was in medical school, and I, I suspect when many of us were training, it was easy. All obesity was was eat less, move more. You know, it's just energy balance. It's just straight thermodynamics. What we've learned since then is that that's actually sadly not true. I mean, if it was, it would be much simpler. Um, it there's so many different factors. Uh, the pathophysiology about this knowledge about this condition has exploded. We know that sleep is a big factor. We know genetics are a big factor. We know gut flora, mood, stress, et cetera, many other different um, uh, drivers for what um, in each individual person is, is driving their obesity. Uh, and there's a great chapter on this uh, that David Lau had presented on in a previous webinar. So we're not gonna go into it, um, but highly recommend looking at that chapter. So this is the actual map of obesity. I love this one from Ian Jansen at Queens. And it just shows that there are elements here which are under an individual's um, control where some behavioral modification could have some influence, um, especially in the lens and primary care around prevention. Um, but there's things that are in people's personal circumstances that are not modifiable. And so we just need to recommend, recognize that this is such a complex condition. So how do we define obesity in the guidelines? So we define obesity as um, adiposity that is causing physical and metabolic harm to a person. So it's not just being a larger human, it's actually having uh, that adiposity causing a problem, a health problem for the person. And that's a real shift in the guidelines that we've talked about in some of the previous webinars. And that's the lens that we're taking when we look at primary care assessment and prevention. The reason why I'm so passionate about primary care as a space for this work is that fewer than 25% of Canadians report ever having a conversation with anybody about their obesity. Um, and that's a real problem because we could be doing things way earlier in the course of the disease to help people um, moderate their, their gain or perhaps become more weight stable, which would have a huge benefit um, downstream. As I like to say to my residents, you know, every patient that we have who's, who's 320 pounds, they were 250 pounds and they were 200 pounds and they were 180 pounds. And chances are that they were in a primary care relationship over that time frame, where it could have been noted that there was weight gain happening and it could have been intervened on earlier in the course of, of their disease. So, when we think about the obesity assessment and we talk about you know, the energy in, energy out, you, you will not lose weight if you don't have a calorie deficit. I mean, that's, that's true. Um, the issue is calorie deficits alone as it relates to um, uh, diet and exercise will, will only take you so far. So in most people, it'll be about three to 5% a sustained change. There's about 5% of people who are different who will be able to achieve uh, more profound weight loss, they are very likely um, having significant differences in their physiology to, to most people. So if we do think about that though, when we're looking at our individual person, we have to think about the energy in, energy out. And we do have to think about it in these different paradigms that Ian was showing on that previous slide. So sociocultural elements, biomedical elements, mental elements, and medications. So as we've seen in previous webinars, um, medications that we prescribe can really be a major driver for people with regards to obesity. So in the assessment chapter, you'll find a really helpful table, uh, which reminds us of the different medications that we often prescribe, which are obesogenic. And we'll talk about the four M's in a moment and break open some of, um, some of these elements a little bit. Social cultural is important because we eat for many reasons other than just uh, to sustain our bodies. There's cultural and um, communal reasons why we eat. And those are really important for our health as well. In terms of energy out, there's our metabolism. So all of these different domains. So certainly we know as we age, for example, um, we have a real difference in terms of our, our bodies, um, in terms of how we handle energy. And then in terms of activity, again, sociocultural norms, biomedical norm uh, issues, mental issues and medication. So I'm gonna direct you to this um, graphic that's in the guidelines um, as appendix two. And you'll see that there's two QR codes um, on this graphic. And the top QR code will take you to the guideline page, which you can also get by typing in Google BC Canada guidelines. 
And the second one, um, which we're going to focus a little bit on today, is um, the primary care assessment toolkit or the 5A's team toolkit. And that'll take you to our webpage um, with uh, some of the tools and resources that have been developed to support primary care assessment and management. And in the middle of that page, um, you'll see, you can also get there by typing in Google Obesity Canada 5AST. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the um, domain is there as well on that little, um, above the little QR code. In the middle of the page, you'll also see a blue box where you can download the primary care assessment toolkits that we've developed. Um, they're free, but uh, we just ask you to sign up for them so that we can know where they're, uh, where they're going because we enjoy looking at the map of different places where they're being used. So we've talked about this before. We've talked about the five A's and we've talked about the guiding points around obesity assessment. We're gonna assume for the purposes of the cases today that we've already asked permission to talk to the person about weight. And we've talked about that previously in Jimena's uh, webinar that she did about weight bias and stigma. And then the key point here in, today is gonna to be the assessment. And, and one of the things we would support is that in primary care, understanding individual stories and life context is really crucial in the management of obesity. So what is their value-based goal? We'll talk about that. How do we classify their obesity? How do we determine the root causes and um, severity? And we'll spend some time on that. And then just to remember the different pillars with regards to management. So we would say for every person, um, nutrition and physical activity are important irrespective of their body size or composition. Uh, and the specific recommendations here with regards to um, the guidelines from medical nutrition therapy and physical activity are, are highlighted. And then remember, we have the three pillars beyond that that can support individuals um, living with obesity. And remember, we have to treat the root causes, right? So if, if, we, if we send someone to bariatric surgery and we haven't dealt with the root causes, we're not gonna have as much success as we would otherwise have. So if one of the root causes is that they had um, significant trauma as a youngster um, and that hasn't been dealt with, then we're gonna have trouble if we, if we don't deal with that, if we just go directly to bariatric surgery. So mainstay of management is also thinking about those root causes. So this is just a little reminder again about the four M's. So in tertiary clinics, um, oftentimes when people come in, they may not know the patient, they've never seen the patient before. They'll give people batteries of tests and go through all of these things in terms of formal screening. That is not terribly workable in primary care where you may have a very different um, uh, amount of resources available and you probably don't need to do it because if you've been taking care of someone for a long time, you probably know quite a lot of this information already. Now, the caution there is, um, one of my pieces, my hubris when I started doing this work was, oh, I know my patients, I'm their family doctor. And one of the things I learned when I started going through the approach that we're gonna present with you today is that I discovered a lot of things about my patients that I didn't know. Uh, so issues of trauma or issues of things that happened in their life that I wasn't aware of. So we can't just assume we have all of this in our EMR, but we can leverage the fact that we have a lot of it in our EMR and we don't have to spend a lot of time uh, and, and in our heads, actually. We don't have to spend a lot of time probing for it. But these are the things when you're going through the assessment you wanna be thinking of because they're things that are gonna be driving that person's um, individual situation. Okay, so um, I just wanna make sure that was a quick, quick, quick review because we're gonna start to go in the cases. So I wanna just take a second and just see if there's any questions or comments or thoughts uh, before we go into the cases. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Uh, please go ahead and raise your hand if you have any question or any comments. Okay, if that's not the case, just carry on, Denise. Okay, yeah, thanks, Arya. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, Stephen first. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about assessment. So we're just going to remember that in the guidelines, um, we think it's important to do an assessment beyond BMI. So BMI is very, very useful at a population measure in terms of telling you about obesity in a population. But as you may recall from this um, paper from Raj Padwal in 2011, BMI does not predict mortality. So the Edmonton Obesity Staging Scale does. Now there's other staging scales that are coming out um, in different places. Uh, I don't think any of them have had this kind of population um, study yet, yet Aria. Uh, but the one that we are we're recommending in the, these guidelines is EOS. And just to remind everybody, this is um, 
how we classify and stage obesity. So the classification is based on BMI. And you'll see that up here in the upper right corner of this graph where class one is 30 to 34.9, class two is 35 to 39.9, class three is 40 to 49.9, class four is 50 to 59.9, and five is over 60. Um, and that's important. It gives you some information and, it, and some um, uh, recommendations and services uh, nationally actually are organized based on BMI still. So you need to know the classification. And then there's the staging. So stage zero is someone who's just a larger human. They have a larger body, but they do not have any obesity related risk factors, no physical symptoms, no psychological symptoms, no functional limitations. And if you follow this through different boxes, then you can see that, uh, that it progresses um, where four is very severe um, disabling disease. So stage one is subclinical, mild, Stage two is has established obesity-related comorbidities requiring medical intervention um, or moderate obesity-related psychological symptoms or moderate functional limitations in daily activities. And three is significant obesity-related end organ damage. So the purpose of this scale, it, it's intended to be a clinical guide um, for us, uh, you know, who are taking care of patients in primary care to say, how serious is this individual's um, disease and do we need to be intervening more than we are? And, and it's helpful because in our panel, we may have 40% of our adult patients who have obesity, um, but if they've been weight stable for the last eight years and are doing really well and don't have any significant limitations, that may not be a place where you need to prioritize your clinical effort today. Um, but there may be other people who are shifting stages where you really need to bring them in and, and think about doing a more intensive assessment. Um, always can open it up with people and ask, ask if they're interested and, and do some mini interventions as well with people who are more stable. So we're gonna talk about Steven. So Steven is 44, he has BMI of 42. He's gained 17 kilos in the last three years. So he is not weight stable. He now has prediabetes, hypertension, GERD, and he had a, the root cause of this was he had a complicated hip fracture three years ago, downhill skiing. So just remember that he has these comorbidities. We're gonna have a couple poll questions. So he has obesity related comorbidities here. And um, he's now having some increased appetite and note some occasional panic attacks. He lives alone. He works from home as an IT consultant. Don't we all work from home now? Has very few social contacts. I text and spends most evenings and weekends in front of the computer. We are all now Steven. Okay, he has no breakfast. He often sleeps in, orders food in, tends to eat uh, mainly during evening and nighttime and often has salty snacks, nuts and chips, etc. He used to be extremely active with varsity football, wrestling, so sports that required um, a weight class. Um, and since the accident, he has not had regular activity. Indeed, he's actually having trouble with walking and sitting for very long. Why is Stephen in positive energy balance? Would you say it's because of increased energy intake, decreased metabolism, or decreased physical activity? Okay. Yeah. So, so people are sort of balanced between the increased energy intake and decreased physical activity. Um, Aria, what's your reaction to this? How would you assess Stephen? Well, I mean, he's clearly said that he's eating a lot or he's eating more. And in fact, actually, if you look at the, just the degree of weight gain, you're talking about, you know, 15 kilos in a very relatively short time. That's a lot of extra, extra calories. So, you know, I don't know how much exercise he was doing before, but he'd have, you know, he'd almost have to be an Olympian athlete, you know, training for the Olympics in order to put that many calories to account for this kind of weight gain. So really, you know, as in most people, the weight gain is because of calories in and not because of calories out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the things about physical activity. So, so in terms of our total energy expenditure, skeletal muscle is about 15% or so of our daily um, energy expenditure. So, um, so it is probably more on the balance of the energy in. And it may be a little bit the met metabolism as well. I mean, if he has been much more sedentary the last few years, he may have a lower bezel metabolic rate if he has less, um, if he has less muscle mass. 
So his issues then are the chronic pain, possibly anxiety. And what I would really submit to all of us in primary care is that the key thing here is to, to understand his value-based health goals, we have to really understand how he's been managing mentally with his change in function. Because what health may have looked like for Stephen five years ago may look very different now. And unpacking that and understanding that's gonna be really important to helping him move into a healthier space. So we're gonna just review the severity element. So how severe is his obesity? So he has a BMI of 42. Yeah, so class three is correct. So he has a BMI of 42. So remember class one is a BMI of 30 to 34.9. Class two is 35 to um, 39.9. Okay, so the next question is, how severe is his obesity? So, so we, as we said, that's the, just the reminder of the, of the different domains. Uh, we're just gonna remember here. So he has a BMI of 42. So he is over the 30, which we need for EOS. He has pre-diabetes, hypertension, reduced morbid mor mobility. So if we remember on our EOS, if you think about those elements, would you say that those are preclinical risk factors, mild, mental, mild, functional? Would you say they're uh, established comorbidity and moderate mental, moderate functional? Or would you say um, that there's uh, end organ damage? Uh, so some, someone who may have had a heart attack or something or severe mental or severe functional? Or would you say it's end stage? Okay, so thinking about um, Stephen who can't sit and can't walk. So where would you put his EOS? Okay, so some people are saying one, some people are saying two, some people are saying three. Um, where would you put him, Aria? Well, I think the majority is right on this one. It's uh, EOS two, and I think the driving uh, factor here was probably his hypertension, the fact that he actually has hypertension as a comorbidity, uh, that would definitely make him a two. Yeah. So, and, and again, this gets into the clinical, clinical decisions. So the, the hypertension would make him a two, but this guy can't walk. So he's got some pretty severe functional limitations. So some people might put him at a three and it really doesn't matter. You know, you may end up putting him as a two, you may end up putting him as a three. The point is, is that he's not, he's not a one. So he is definitely, he's definitely needing intervention. So if he was at a lower body mass, he may have some improvement in terms of his function. Um, and certainly we don't wanna continue on a weight gain trajectory of another 17 kilos over the next three years. So this is a gentleman who needs um, intervention in primary care because he's not weight stable and he is really experiencing um, impairment. Okay, so let's stop there for a sec and open it up for discussion, for questions, and then we'll start, uh, we'll do Nancy, which is a little bit more of a management management case. <laughs> okay. Well, no, 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 Denise, Denise, you didn't talk much about, um, you know, about how you would actually manage this case. Do you want to say a few words on that? Uh, what would be your yeah. first thoughts? Yeah, we definitely can talk about management. I mean, I think uh, we're going to go into it a little bit more in Nancy, but I think the, the number one thing is going to be to understand his context. So what does his life look like right now? Is he experiencing some profound depression? You know, is some of that hyperphagia related to that? Um, really unpacking just what is the meaning for him of this huge change in function that he's had? Um, and then uh, getting into some um, deep discussions about where he's at, what his health goals are, is he concerned about this change? You know, is this something that's worrying him? Um, and uh, to what extent is the weight actually contributing to some of his physical impairment? Uh, are there things we could be doing to manage his pain better? Um, does he have sleep apnea and other things, which we'll talk about in a minute with Nancy? Um, so there, there is, is a one, question. There is a question from Ryan, and uh, you know this is a, this is a very interesting question because you know this is the kind of question you would ask yourself uh, very often. I mean, how would you include family history in? the admin system. Now, we didn't include it in the admin system, I can say that much, but how much would you take uh, someone's family hi history into consideration, both in terms of obesity itself, but also in terms of comorbidities? Yeah, good question, Ryan. So I think um, if people have one adult uh, parent, uh, sorry, one parent with who lives with obesity, they have a 40% increased chance 
of um, being a larger human. And if they have two parents, they have an 80% chance of being a larger human. So um, the, the natural range of where their BMI will sit will be will be higher. That's, you know, so the issue is how do you help people be as healthy as possible within that range? Um, not to say that someone has to have a uh, BMI that's lower than where their range is going to set them at. Um, for Ryan, if for, or sorry, not Ryan, for the patient, Stephen, um, he was a football player and he was also a wrestler. And those are two sports where frequently people uh, struggle with obesity in later life. Um, because with, weight, with wrestling, they're constantly getting down to a target weight. So in that constant trying to be at that lower weight class and keep that lower weight, they often yo-yo, which um, is not good for their, um, uh, for their metabolism. And second, for football, often um, people are encouraged to, to be really big. You know, if you're really big and muscular, it's, it's better for your chances of being at a higher level in football. So a varsity football player, and some of those uh, people may end up uh, being encouraged to take supplements or steroids or things that may cause them to bulk up when they're younger people. And when they're older and no, no, no longer at that level of physical fitness, it's very, very diff difficult to maintain that muscle mass. They're going to be much more prone to, to, to having obesity later in life. So, um, so those are things around not only family history, but also his own personal sport history, which may be making it harder for him uh, to, um, to maintain his weight. And then he's had this huge change in his physical function. And that's the, the biggest thing is, is this injury that he sustained, um, which is making it really hard for him to be mobile. And as a young man, that's really, really difficult. Plus all those factors we talked about, the social isolation um, and all the different things that could be playing in. So unpacking that is pretty core uh, to, to helping him uh, move into a healthier space. Arya, would you have other thoughts on that one? No, I think you summed it up pretty well. Um, I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have much to add. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think we can probably move on to the next case. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about management with Nancy. So for Nancy, Nancy is 57. She um, uh, she's, uh, has a BMI of 39.7 and she has chronic back pain doesn't tell us here how severe that is, but, um, but pretty severe. She has uh, diabetes, so she's on metformin and insulin. And uh, she has a history of depression, which is doing very well, treated with Paxil. So I want you to note those items. So we're now gonna move a little bit more into management. So she's got this chronic back pain. She's on metformin and insulin. What do we know about those medications? And she's on Paxil. What do we know about that medication? Um, she has a great family life, a super um, relationship with her husband. Her kids are adults. She has lots of friends and family. She was very active in the community. Um, she was a, a small business owner um, and she sold her business uh, as is currently working part-time as a receptionist, which isn't as gratifying to her as, as the business that she ran. Um, She's uh, really busy. She struggles with to find time to prepare proper meals. Um, she's had uh, a lot of yo-yo dieting, so cabbage soup diet and zing diet, uh, and finds herself craving foods that are high in fat and sugar, chips with dip and ice cream at nighttime. So nighttime is always tough for her. She used to be really active in her 20s, very, very active. Uh, as mentioned, she was a small business owner and currently she's not engaged in any formal activity. So just going back then, so remember her BMI was 39.7. So if you were um, assessing Nancy, where would you put her severity based on her BMI? How severe is her obesity? So EOS one, two, or three? Yeah, okay. So she has established diabetes, which would mean it's not preclinical diabetes. So she would be a two at least. And for the people, for the three, that's the, really the, the question, the golden question of how impaired is she with that back pain? Um, currently doing uh, well from the fact of depression. We don't really know much about how the weight's affecting her psychologically, but her depression is good. So the issue is just with the chronic back pain, how much dysfunction is she having? And that could tip her into a three. So 
So, uh, so class two and then EOS stage three, uh, two to three, depending. So we're gonna just pivot now. So in that QR code that I showed you before for a primary care assessment, we've spent several years actually um, in our group trying working with patients and co-designing tools to help support uh, primary care intervention, which is pretty efficient um, rather than having batteries of screening tests. And it basically has four tools um, and those can be spread over a couple of visits. Um, so I'm just going to show you what they look like, and it's a way that you can think about organizing your, your OBC history. Um, so there's a lot of different components, and if you look at the assessment chapter, those are the kinds of things that ultimately you're going to want to think about for your, your patient. Um, but this, this first tool just really helps you get an overview of their current physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health all of which plays into it in much the same way that we just said for Steven. So if we think about Nancy, um, currently she would say that her emotional life um, uh, is, her depression's better. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, she had her dad had a stroke um, and, and uh, so she fell into a depression. She's doing better with the, with the Paxil currently. Um, currently uh, she has a really supportive family as we heard. So those are all protective. She has lots of friends in the community. Those are all perspective. Um, her mobility, she's having trouble walking due to her back pain. And, and that's really an issue for her. Um, she doesn't have any issues with daily activities in terms of getting dressed and personal hygiene. And I would highlight the webinar that Dr. Mary Forehand and colleagues did on, um, uh, on you know, activities of daily living and how that often affects our patients living with obesity. So important to ask those questions. Uh, Nancy is not having any issues with that. Uh, her current uh, occupation is she's working in a receptionist in a doctor's office. She previously owned her own business um, and she has enough income. So the, the key question here is when we think about those forums and we think about social, social milieu, um, you know, probing to make sure people have me, like means to be able to afford food in the cupboard and activities and things like that. So then we're not recommending things that are totally unfeasible for a person's life context. Um, then chronic illness. So she, she has diabetes and depression. And as we mentioned, she's on the Paxil, she's on the metformin and on the insulin. Um, so as we hear that, anybody want to chime in? What are you thinking when you hear those medications? Any of the participants want to kind of chime in? I don't know if you remember from the previous, um, but table, there's a really helpful table in the assessment chapter on the medications that are obesogenic. So she's on Paxil, it's a very obesogenic um, medication, as well as um, she's on insulin, which is also obesogenic, okay? And she's had, she's not been weight stable since she's been on that insulin. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, I think there's a question or something, Aria, under the more button in the chat. Uh, yeah, Barbara, yeah, exactly. Barbara said, yes, absolutely. Both of those are obesogenic. So those are things that we need to be thinking about as we're assessing her. So then other medical issues. So she doesn't have any skin problems or urinary incontinence. So when, this is important to probe for because um, I certainly have patients when we get into it that are really embarrassed and they, they stop going to the gym because they find that they leak urine. Uh, well, you know, I need to do, that's my job. I need to help get them sorted out so that they're not leaking urine so they can go to the gym. So again, unpacking those forums and understanding what's going on. Um, Intertrigo issues with skin folds, you know, just recommending someone go to the gym to go to the pool to swim. Well, it's tricky if you're going to have trouble um, getting a suit that fix, fits, having trouble getting dry, having trouble with skin breakdown. So really unpacking what might be going on for the person is important. Um, other concerns, maybe there's something more important than, than, uh, than this going on for the person. Maybe they're suffering with an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction. So probing for other things. Um, and then her pain. So she's having a lot of issues with back pain. Now, if you're her uh, family physician, you're going to know that. And, um, and that'll help give you some, some, from some context. Um, she's not sleeping well, really poor sleep, tired when she wakes up. That makes us think about sleep apnea, right? Uh, maybe we need to probe a little bit more there. Um, and then she's got really regular work hours and volunteering right now. So she's finding time management is a little bit tricky. 
So this is kind of a, a quick check-in on people's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health probes into a bunch of areas. And together with what we already know about people, um, it can be really, really helpful. The most important thing is here in the middle. It's the value-based goal, value-based health goal. What matters for this person? Is there something that they wanna do that they can't do now? So she wants to be able to get up from a seated position without too much difficulty. Why does that matter to Nancy? Well, it matters because she wants to be able to get down and play with her grandkids. So it is so much more motivating for people to work towards a value-based goal that matters to them rather than to say, I want to do, you know, 150 minutes of exercise. That, that's not terribly meaningful. But being able to say, hey, you know what, I can now get down and play with my grandkids. That's meaningful. So that gives, us the, that, that gives them something to sustain the hard work that they need to do uh, to be able to move into the healthier space. So the second tool here is um, the weight trajectory. And, and you'll read about this in the assessment chapter. This is the way that we formulated where the, the key question here for a person is, can you tell me um, as far back as makes sense for you um, about your life, your health and your weight? And people will say, you know, at different points that this was an issue. So Nancy is like, oh, you know what? I didn't really have a an issue with my, in my child and adolescent years. I wasn't really suffering with weight. Other people may, may, they may be like, I was really bullied for my weight. Um, I was put on a, um, a diet by my mother when I was eight. Uh, one of my, you know, um, uh, I was never permitted to go to birthday parties because um, my family didn't, my mother didn't want me eating cake. Uh, you know, you'll get a lot of interesting things back into this early childhood period, maybe significant losses, traumas, etc., all of which could be playing into the person's um, later uh, life events. And then you, you check out what's gone on with the person, what's been going on. So you can see here that when she started working in her new business, building up her own business, working really irregular hours, she had some weight gain, she had some depression, she was put on Paxil, she gained some weight. She then did a really radical diet, dropped quite a lot of weight um, with the cabbage soup and was doing gym and exercise, but it wasn't enough to keep her stable because she then was increasing. She had some challenges with teenagers um, and was diagnosed with uh, diabetes, was put on some metformin. Um, and then she peaked over here when her dad had a stroke and she fell into some um, more difficulties with her business, started taking Paxil again ended up with some more instability in terms of her diabetes, was put on insulin and continued to have weight gain. So the story gives you an awful lot of information. It also helps the person understand that all of the root causes that led to the circumstances in which they currently find themselves are captured here. And you have a much, much stronger sense. Now, the thing with this that was the most important thing um, the whole time you're listening as, as their clinician, you're listening for um, what are those root causes? So you're picking up on the Paxil, you're picking up on the insulin, you're picking up on the back pain. You may be picking up on different things that may have happened to contribute to their obesity. But the other thing you're listening for the entire time is strength. Um, and that was something that came out in our research is incredibly important. Um, it actually really broke my heart when we were doing this. I had, I had one patient in one of the interviews that we did after we had done this, who was crying because um, with, the inter with the researcher because no, they didn't think that they had any strengths. And so the labeling of strengths was incredibly powerful and important. And it actually really seeks, shifts people in terms of their, their head space. So this is this next tool, which is the strengths and challenges. So the way that I would generally do this with a patient is I will say, so what I'm hearing in your story is many strengths. You have a fantastic relationship with your husband. You have great kids. People are doing really well. You have lots of friends and community. You've overcome a lot of challenges in the past. Your mood's actually doing really well right now. Um, uh, you know, These are all the, the strengths that this person has. Very resilient, very capable person. Um, you have some current challenges. So currently you're on a couple of medications which are quite obesogenic. You have this back pain, which is really affecting your function and you're not sleeping well and you're having these nighttime cravings. And then you go back to the person and say, does this capture it? And they may say, oh, partially, but also blah, blah, blah. There's this other thing going on. 
or it does capture it. So you, you just, and this may take you to the end of the first visit. So I find this takes about 20 minutes to go through the whole thing. The follow on visits are shorter. Um, and then the next parts are gonna be into your action planning. Um, so this is a way of integrating a lot of, and that's why I've actually taken away the, the notion of screening to probing for things. So things you need to attend to, but you don't need to sit there and give people 25 questionnaires about uh, whether they have this or whether they have that condition. As a primary care provider, you can sort that out in a little bit more of a um, efficient way based on leveraging what you know about the person already and some judicious probing. And the lovely fact that you can actually keep seeing them over time means you can keep your antennae out for things that may be um, arising uh, down the road. So I just want to stop here for a sec because um, because this is this takes us to the end of the assessment and I think it's worth taking a minute to talk about it. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or reactions to this? And then we're going to go into action planning. No, Denise, you've already talked about the fact that as a family doctor, you will already have a lot of information, but uh, but you've taken us through quite a bit of detail. So can you give us something? uh you know related to the time frame how long does this conversation take and does it all have to happen in one sitting uh yeah so i think this part of the conversation so the, the i would never do this in the middle of a random visit i used to try um i could turn a stroke strep throat visit into an obc visit i don't do that because i think it really makes it hard to manage your day so the asking permission always for me happens at a different visit so perhaps i've seen them for something where um, I've noticed a significant change in their weight, or they're having some complications of a weight related comorbidity, uh, or I'm seeing them perhaps for a physical, you know, to do a, a well woman exam or something like that. And, and I've noticed that, that, that things aren't stable and that they're causing some concern. And then I'll ask for people, you know, would it be okay if we talked about the weight and do a very gentle little probe and then say, is that something you'd like to sit down and have a real conversation about? And, um, uh, oftentimes it is, and people then say yes, and then I have them book back for this visit. And practically the way I handle it is I always visit, book this visit at, um, at a time where I don't overbook the visit. So uh, I'm not gonna try to see two other patients in the same time slot. And I always book um, uh, you know, at the end of the day. So that if I run over five minutes, it's not upsetting the whole list. Um, and I can, you know, I've done it a lot now, so I can do this assessment in 20 minutes. Um, and what it does is it sets up a whole foundation for all of our future visits, which make which saves a lot of time on the back end. So the follow up visits can be 10 minutes. Um, this one visit needs to be 20 because you really need to get into the story. And that's one of the things that I really learned, um, like on this with my patients is boy, oh boy, oh boy, have I ever been surprised. Um, I remember one of the champions who worked on this project was actually one of my patients. And I remember when I met this person, uh, before we started doing this work, Aria, um, and they were suffering with really severe osteoarthritis, and they were a little bit of a heavy set person. And in the previous time, I might have said, oh, well, you know, if you lose five to 10 pounds, you're going to um, uh, really help your knee pain. Fortunately, I didn't do that. I had actually asked permission to discuss and asked, you know, so can you tell me a little bit about this? And the patient had actually lost 100 pounds and had kept it off for eight years. So it would have been colossally stupid for me to just launch into, well, you know, if you lose five to 10 pounds, I mean, this patient's not gonna lose another five to 10 pounds. They were one of the 5% of outliers that could actually lose 100 pounds in the first place. So, so recognizing and dialing into where people are at matters. And then going into this journey with weight, what you find out is things that people didn't tell you before, you know? Um, so, you know, uh, they've had some sort of significant trauma, you know, perhaps they lost a child and you didn't actually even know about that. Um, perhaps they, su they suffered some severe, you know, trauma at some point in their life. Doing this and actually asking that, the stuff comes out that I didn't actually get before. Um, and it reframes the entire subsequent um, stuff that we do together uh, in really foundational ways because um, you need that information. So, so, so if yeah. I can call out, so so obviously, I mean, you're going into a lot of detail here, which uh, you know, in my experience, sometimes patients are simply not expecting. I mean, you know, they're expecting, okay, this conversation is going to be about weight, so they're expecting, you know, yeah, she's going to ask me a few questions about what I eat, and she's going to ask me a few questions about how much I exercise, but you're going into a whole bunch of things that 
patients themselves might actually not even consider relevant to their weight till you ask the question and explain why you're asking the question. So how do you deal with that sort of with that expectation that patients have that this is going to be about diet and exercise? Uh, yeah, and actually patients love that it's not about diet and exercise because <laughs> oftentimes people have felt shamed and blamed in healthcare um, encounters in the past. So there's nothing shaming and blaming about this. It's a very strength-based approach. Um, and at follow-up visits, you can, you can probe about some of those other types of things. Um, so, there's so a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of tools on the website that I can't get into in the time we have today. But um, and there's some videos about how to do this as well. Um, but so, yeah, it, it's a little bit of setting up of expectation. I, there's also a patient part of this which I give people, um, which explains to them a little bit the why. So sometimes I'll actually give them the uh, toolkit before they come back. Uh, and they can see a little bit the patient side. So there's there's actually um, a script in the tools which talks about, which you can show people to set them up. So when I'm running them through the tools, I say, this is the why, and this is why we're going through that, which also helps with some of that reframing area. So so if you take the 20 minutes that you say this takes you now, now that you've experienced and you've done this over and over again, it's about 20 minutes to take people to the journal. How many of those 20 minutes do you actually spend on diet and exercise? Mm, very little like two minutes? Not even. That may come up at the next, at the next follow on visits. This is all about understanding where people are at. Okay, so you would say for the initial assessment of obesity, diet and exercise are not the key information that you're looking for? They're not the key information we're, we're looking for. Nope. Okay. All right. And, and so if it turns out that one of the action plan items is around diet and exercise, so you know, the first patient, Stephen, who was talking about the high calorie snacks and things like that. Um, when we get into the action planning, one of the issues might be, uh, you know, giving him the three, uh, three day dietary history to do and having him come follow up with myself or Jen, who's the dietitian who works in our clinic uh, to unpack some of that. If that's the priority issue that he wants to work on. Um, so it's very much about going where the person wants to go. If where he wants to go is dealing with the chronic pain first, then that's what we deal with first. So, you know, the lovely thing about primary care uh, as distinct from specialty care is that you get to see people back, <laughs> you know? And so you, you don't have to solve it all in the first visit. So this is all about all of those root causes and understanding context. Okay, I don't see any, any further questions. Uh, but yeah. Have okay. Yeah. And so those other bits, I mean, in the guideline, you'll see um, in Jennifer uh, Brown's chapter, uh, sort of when you're trying to do the nutrition piece, um, how you would go through that nutrition focused assessment. There's a lovely table in that chapter that walks you through that if that's the issue. But what I would submit to you, if the patient says to you, um, the reason like, you know, they're 320 pounds is because they're invisible. And what they mean is that they're invisible in a sexual sense, and it transpires that they had massive amounts of trauma. You could calorie count till the cows come home. You're not losing any weight until you deal with that trauma. So it's really about attending to the focus for the person about what's driving the situation in the first place. Okay, so then we pivot to action planning. So action planning, um, so what this person wanted to do was the sleep is really a problem. So we wanted to do uh, get a sleep study. That's a great action. Um, the second one is um, medications. So can we perhaps stop the Paxil or if we still need to be on some sort of medication for the depression, um, can we move to a Wellbutrin or something that's more weight neutral? In terms of the um, insulin, uh, could we think about a different agent that's more weight neutral? Could we think about liraglutide, for example? Um, and again, subsequent conversations could also get into if those cravings keep being an issue. Would this be a patient where the bupropion and naltrexone combination might be a thought? You know, so you can think about the, the overlaying this with the diabetes management as well in terms of whether they need to be on any of the other sorts of agents for, that might be helpful for other comorbidities they might have. And then getting the back pain under control. So, you know, I think with this particular person, um, she's loosely modeled over a patient of mine who had spinal stenosis. 
And we really did need to get that patient on some liraglutide and off the insulin. Uh, and so going from 147 kilos that the patient was down to 117 kilos, the patient was still living with obesity, but the spinal stenosis was drastically better, functions way better, mood was way better, cravings were way better, right? So, so you really have to make your, um, your actions uh, really tailored to what the person wants to do. Um, the reason why we use the word action was we created these tools with patients and all the patients hated the word goal. They did not want the word goal on there. They were really, really clear about that. So we used the word action, which they really liked. Um, and you can see the typical um, things to walk people through the breakdown and to think about um, how confident they are and those kinds of things. Recognizing what we know about motivational interviewing that people have to be at least 80% confident with their goal. So you can sort of build um, progress with them over time. Uh, I think we have a question, Aria. I don't. Oh no, it's the evaluation thing. Okay, so um, that's pretty much what I have here uh, in terms of these cases, but I really wanna make sure we have some minutes for discussion. We've got another six minutes or so. So curious for other thoughts, maybe we can have people chime in. So while we're looking for people to chime in, I would, uh, I, you know, just out of curiosity, at what point would you bring up the issue or possibility of bariatric surgery? I mean, here you have a patient who, you know, according to the textbook, even according to these guidelines, would have an indication for bariatric surgery. Uh, but obviously, it's not the first thing you talk about. But when would you bring this up? And, and uh, what questions would you ask the patient to see whether they have any interest or whether it would be appropriate to bring up the topic? Yeah, no, good point. So, um, so when people go into the action plan and they start to really engage with the different items, um, bariatric surgeries, obviously, um, we would bring out the tool and the normal expectations for weight loss. So, you know, reviewing with people that um, lifestyle modification is going to get them three to 5%. Um, if her, um, if she's not getting to the functional goals that she wants to get to, um, with sort of the measures that we do in the first bit, uh, then we really need to think about um, other options. So medications or surgery. Uh, in this instance, she has an indication for the molecule for liraglutide already. So definitely something that we could do. Um, and, uh, you know, of course there's barriers around coverage for some patients, but often if they're taking it for um, glycemic control, the molecule can be covered as Victoza, uh, which makes it feasible for a lot more patients. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then if they're still having, you know, significant issues, then you have to really get into what are the different options. But I think it's really important that we set up people for success with bariatric surgery. So I wouldn't recommend ever just referring to bariatric surgery and not um, doing something with the 18 month wait time you'll have in Alberta. Uh, to get into the program, right? And bariatric surgery, I think when we look at the national guidelines and we look at access to bariatric surgery, it could be much longer than that in some jurisdictions. So what we wanna do is set up an effective plan so that people are coming in and following up for their obesity just as they would for their diabetes, you know, treating it like any other chronic disease and work on the value-based goals and work on what we can do to modify the course. Um, uh, and yeah, for sure, bariatric surgery is an indication for this particular patient um, uh, and definitely something that they could consider if they wanted to do so. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions from the, uh, uh, from the participants, but so I, so I have another question and that is, uh, now you run a general you know, family medicine practice where you deal with all kinds of issues, but you obviously have taken a keen interest in obesity. You've learned a lot about obesity. You've been doing obesity research now for several years. So how much of your time as a family doctor would you say, you know, are you now paying attention to obesity, you know, compared to the things you were doing before you started on this journey? That's a great question. Uh, I think I'm much more attuned to it uh, in all the patients I see. And you know, it's not a rare disease. So, so, you know, in the course of a day, you know, there's a lot of patients who may have obesity, but also a lot of patients who may not be weight stable. Um, so I'm much more likely to have a conversation with parents um, earlier than I might've been before. Uh, much more likely to have a brief intervention with people who don't have obesity yet, but who are not weight stable. So I'm thinking of a patient of mine, um, 
where and the lovely thing about family medicine is you do know everyone, the family usually, right? And so um, I was thinking of a young person whose uh, parents suffer with obesity and who had um, become very unweight stable during college, had gone away and um, had come back having gained quite a bit of weight um, and was not, was not in the obese range yet, but had gone from a BMI of 23 to a BMI of 26 in a very short period of time. So I'm much more likely to say, hey, you know, can we talk about weight? Um, tell me a little bit what's going on. Do a little bit of a probe. Try to figure what's going on. Do a little bit of um, action planning with the person. And when they came back a year later, their BMI was 24.5. So, you know, those kinds of interventions are things that are, it's, it's much easier to intervene on five or 10 pounds um, than it is to intervene on 50 or 80 pounds. So those little interventions with people, if you see them not being weight stable are things I would say I do lots. And then oh. probably do this three times a week. Uh, oh. th these bigger assessments about three times a week with people. Well, Venice, thanks so much for taking us to these cases. I don't see any active questions at this point. So I'd like to take the opportunity of thanking you for presenting the two cases. I'd like to thank the participants for taking the time to attend this. Uh, I think there's yeah. a brief announcement here regarding the uh, weight management over reproductive years of adult women living with obesity, which is a whole chapter on its own in the guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines of that chapter is going to be presented on March 23rd. Uh, and if you've signed up for the mailing list, then you'll probably you know, get the details on when that's happening. Uh, so on that note, uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you haven't already done so, please uh, fill out the evaluation questionnaires that you're going to be sent or that you can access here. Uh, and on that note, I think uh, we've come to an end. So thanks everybody around.